All right, in this video, I'm going to see how we can use Selenium to pull the data out of the second uh, table on this page. And just to remind you what's kind of tricky about this page is if I refresh, the second table only gets loaded after about a second. So if we were using something like request.lit, uh, we wouldn't even really see that. And in fact, if I right click on here and I hit view page source, um, you can see that uh, in my HTML, right? I mean, I have, I have the first table, and it says, and add another one, and there's no table here, right? So if I was just kind of reading through this HTML, um, I'm not going to be able to get that data the way I'd want to. The, da the data only really shows up when this JavaScript code runs, and it adds that. And of course, kind of trying to understand this JavaScript code um, is very non-trivial, right? So what I'd rather do is have Selenium run the JavaScript code for me, and then kind of see what, what it adds in the end. And, um, and so to kind of start off, I think it'll be a little easier to see what's going on if I'm running all the code on, on my laptop. So I'm on localhost here. Um, you know, I haven't taught you how to install Selenium on your own laptop, so you won't be able to follow along with this um, kind of demonstration. So just watch and enjoy. Um, during the second piece, I will move over to my virtual machine where I did teach you how to install Selenium. So if you wanted to, then you could kind of follow along there. Okay, so here I am. I'm gonna create a new notebook. And uh, and there's some kind of tedious uh, kind of setup stuff, so I'm just going to copy that here from from the slides rather than kind of type it out while you're watching. And um, and so what is this doing? Well, we already installed the Selenium uh, package, and I'm going to import WebDriver from it. I am going to import this options thing from Chrome. Each of the web browsers has some different options. And, uh, and then there's a bunch of exceptions that can happen. And the one I'm going to be using today is called no such element exception. So I'm going to import that. Um, I'm going to start. I'm going to create a new options object. Uh, this headless thing, we're going to talk about that soon, right? And not yet. Just kind of ignore that for now. And then here I actually create um, a new uh, Chrome browser, right? And I call that B for browser. So let me actually just run this and we'll see what happens. That, as you can see, um, opens up this new browser window. And I, I don't know if you can quite read that, but it says Chrome is being controlled by automated test software. Uh, this whole Selenium tool was built in the mind of kind of testing um, web pages. We aren't interested in testing. This is a data science course. Um, my only kind of interest is, is how Selenium will help us pull data off of pages that have JavaScript. Um, and that's going to be very useful for us, even though um, Selenium was built kind of more with testing in mind than web scraping. Okay, so there I am. And uh, and if I want to, I can say things like g.get. Uh, let's say I want to go to like, you know, google.com. I could do that. Uh, B actually. B is um, my browser object, right? So I'm going to do .get .google .com and uh, and um, And it's happy. I guess that's an invalid URL. Let, let me actually just kind of type it properly, right? It's HTTPS like that. And, and I can see that it, when I run that, it automatically goes there. Um, if I wanted to, I could go to my website, you know, let me do this, https.carazaharder.com. I can do that. It goes to my website. Cool. Um, what I wanted to do is I wanted to go to this page uh, right here. So I'm going to copy that and I'm going to put this here and it's going to go to that page and load it. Right? And if I run this again, it kind of refreshes each time. Okay, so that's that's good. And um, and after I do that, there's an attribute called b dot page source, and it's not a function, so I don't or method, so I don't do that. Uh, this is just an attribute, and it gives me a string of what's currently on the page. Right. So so if I run that, and I kind of look through here, I can see that there's the first table. And, and then it seems like there's about to be another table and there's nothing nothing there yet, right? So this kind of ran, right? I got this HTML before that second table even, even showed up. Now, if I add another code down here, another cell down here, and I run the same thing again, so let's say I say, um, uh, let's a second time print b.page source, I do that. And, uh, and now what's actually pretty cool is that I get some HTML 
uh, for that second table. And what's happening here is this HTML didn't come out of any kind of file, right? That was not in uh, the HTML source code for this page. Um, what happened is that on the right, I had something like this. I had this HTML with one table and then this JavaScript code started running and the JavaScript code added another table. Not, not, it didn't create new tags, but it created new elements in the DOM, in the document object model. And so what's happening here when I say page source, it's not giving me the actual HTML uh, for the page, but it's kind of translating back. It's converting the DOM back to the equivalent HTML uh, for the purposes of, well, giving me something I can actually work with, right? So that has all the data there I'm interested in, um, which is very cool. Um, now, what I can do, uh, if I'm kind of looking through here, I can see that there's two table tags, right? There's um, this table tag, and you can actually give names to tags in HTML using ID. So this one has ID alpha, and this one has ID chords for coordinates. And, uh, and that's actually a handy way when we're parsing things to try to find a particular piece of data. And, and so if I do something like this, if I say like, you know, b.findElement uh, by ID, and I say chords, um, I, I get this thing, this um, Selenium web element corresponding to that, that table. Um, if, I, if I put some garbage here, like missing, I get a no such element uh, exception, right? So here's what I want to do, right? Uh, that, you know, that page normally takes one second to load the second table. What I want to do is kind of, you know, wait until it is loaded, right? And, and, and one way I can wait is I can use, um, I can use this. I can say import time and I could do something like, well, print A, print B, and I could say like time.sleep. Um, let's say, you know, 2000 milliseconds is two seconds. So if I do that, I get, you know, A, wait two seconds, and then I get, wow, time, time is crawling. You know what? I got it wrong. Let me just kind of interrupt this. This is actually seconds. So I think I want to do two. I'm just trying to make a note here. That's two seconds. We would have been waiting there for quite a while, actually. You run that. Well, that seems weird. Let me, is it milliseconds or is it uh, seconds? Let me, this would be one second, A, and then, let me interrupt that. But if I just say one, there it goes. So, so it is one second. What, what was I typing before? Okay, that's two seconds. Let me try three seconds. That is three seconds. Maybe I didn't interrupt it properly. Sorry, sorry for the confusion. So this is in seconds, right? And that's waiting three seconds. And so down here, what I want to do is I want to have some sort of like time.sleep. And the big question is, well, how long? And, um, and that's tricky, right? Because sometimes a page might load quickly. Sometimes it might load slowly. Um, I could error on kind of a really big number, right? I mean, I could say like, you know, wait one minute. But that's not great because then I'm wasting time when it's faster. So a better strategy is if we can just kind of keep checking um, until the table is there, right? And uh, and I, I will know if the table is there because when I do this find element by ID, if it's there, then it works. And if it's not there, then I get an error, right? So let me, let me go back to chords. And, um, and I think I actually, since I restarted this, I lost my... Uh, browser, right? So let me just kind of run through this again. And I'll delete this for now. And run through this again. I have my browser up again, hopefully. There we go. And um, and then I can actually start using it, right? So the idea down here is, let me just write some pseudo code, right? So I want to say, I want to keep looping. And then I want to check if we have the content. If so, I'm going to break. Otherwise, wait a bit. Um, and the idea here is that I don't want to check like 
constantly, but I want to check maybe every tenth of a second or something like that. Okay, so how do I check if the content is there? I have to have a try, right? So maybe I'll just try to leave these comments here. Like so, I'm going to have a try, and, um, and I'm going to paste this thing. I'm going to see if I can find that content. And then I have an accept down here. And uh, and then I need to wait, right? If, if, I, if I don't have it yet, then I need to wait a while. So I'm going to say time.sleep, you know, something. And I'll come back to that. Um, if this works and I don't have an exception, then I want to break out of this loop. I don't want to keep checking again and again. Right? So I'm going to have something like this. Um, you know, let's just check every quarter second like that. Uh, they better say like waiting, something like that. Okay, uh, let's give this a try. Waiting, waiting, waiting until it hits the page. And then if I scroll down and look at this page source after that, then guess what? Um, I have have the the, the table, and and so the beauty of this is if it takes long or slow. Um, I'll just try to wait however long necessary, not longer and not, not shorter. Okay, so that's good. Um, this is an example of polling. And by polling, uh, I mean uh, checking uh, until it is ready. Right, so polling is kind of a common strategy. Just check, check, are you ready now? Are you ready now? Are you ready now? Um, kind of a like a child in the back seat on a long car trip, right? They keep asking, are we there yet? And, uh, and sometimes in programming, that's the appropriate thing to do. Um, one last thing I want to do here is um, I want to say have some sort of maximum time. You know, maybe I'll say like max equals, you know, 10 seconds. Because maybe like the internet's down or like there's a serious problem with the site. And, and so I wouldn't want to keep doing this for like, you know, five hours, right? So generally what I'll do is I'll, I'll say something like this, you know, something like for I and range of, um, you know, if I want to do it a maximum of 10 seconds and each time I check, I wait a quarter second, then I guess I'd wait like 40 times max, right? And, uh, and that's trying to be better, right? And if I, if I search for something like garbage, I'll just see what will happen there. It'll eventually give up. The very end, it'll give up. And, uh, after 10 seconds and then, well, whatever, I, I couldn't have... Well, it was waiting for that other thing to show up, the, the missing chords too. And uh, and it gave me the content even if it didn't have that. So this is kind of a general way that you'll uh, be grabbing content. You'll retry, you'll have some sort of maximum, and then you'll wait between between checking. Okay, so back to chords, and I have the page. Okay, so I want to review um, Selenium, or, or Beautiful Soup a little bit. Um, Selenium helps us run JavaScript and kind of uh, to kind of grab the changes from JavaScript and HTML, but uh, a more useful tool that we learned in CS220 uh, was Beautiful Soup, which would actually help us pull content out of here. So what I'd like to do with this demo is I'd like to try to get this thing um, into a data frame. Okay, so let's do that. Um, and maybe I'll just try to get rid of this for now. Just try to clean it up a little bit. Um, what I will do is I'll say from beautiful soup for import beautiful soup and uh, and then I create a, a beautiful soup document from that HTML that I had. So I think that was something called like you know uh, my selenium browser dot page source and let me look at this page. And that's great. So I was able to get it. Um, maybe you remember in uh, Beautiful Soup, I could do things like, you know, page dot find, and I couldn't find a table tag. Uh, that would give me the first table. Um, if I did a find all, it would give me a list of the tables. And so maybe I'm going to say something like this, tables equals this. Let me ch check the length of the tables. Um, maybe a good thing to do here would be to make sure that uh, I, I have exactly two tables. So maybe I'll say something like assert that equals two and uh, and so at this point the table i really want is that second one and it looks like this and um and, and so maybe what i can do right is if i uh if i get a, a you know a list 
of list to construct a data frame. What I'd like to do is, is kind of get this list of all the rows here and use that to construct a pandas data frame so I actually have those coordinates to work with. So, so what I want to do is I have this thing, this table here, and, and when I have that thing, I can find all the rows. So remember that TR stands for table row. And so if I do that, that's going to get me all the rows. And I can loop over those. I could say for, you know, TR and that, maybe I'll just print it. And, and so that's great, right? So maybe, um, <coughs> so maybe what I'll do now is for each of these, I'd like to actually get out the values, you know, like X, Y, uh, 0, 1, so on and so forth, right? So for each of these, maybe I'll say table row dot find all td and all of these things and um and then kind of like what i want to do is i just want to have a list right i just want these raw values uh kind of at the base here and and so what i'll do is i want to run something on each of these elements right and i can use a list comprehension so i can say something like something for something in that and that's going to take each of the things in here and uh, put in a variable name here. So maybe I'll say like TD and then run some code here. And whatever this code gives me, it's trying to give me a list of those things, right? So I, I could say something like, you know, TD dot text, I think it is. And, uh, and now I see I'm in pretty good shape, right? I'm kind of looping over all these things and, and kind of getting all these lists. So instead of uh, printing all of these, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna append it to rows like this. And so then I have my nice list of rows here. And, uh, and at this point, I can actually start building my data frame. I'm gonna say pandas.dataframe. And, uh, and what do I wanna pass in? I wanna pass in, um, well, let's try this. Oh, what did I, where did I import that? Sorry, I, I have to import pandas somewhere. So I'm gonna say import pandas as pd. I'm gonna do that. And, um, and you can see it's a little weird, right? I mean, it's using that first row as actual data. So maybe what I'd like to do is, is kind of uh, slice that off. So I don't have X and Y in my actual data. And then the other thing I can do is I can say columns equals, um, I may pull that from that zeroth row. So I'm gonna do that. And now I have this beautiful data frame, uh, which was constructed by it was constructed from this uh, data here, right? This kind of tricky table uh, that pops up later. So let's just kind of really quickly recap what we did here, right? We navigated to the page. Uh, we kept checking until the, the table loaded, however long that needed to be, up to 10 seconds. After the table loaded, we pulled out the page source and we used beautiful soup to analyze it. We used it to find all the tables on that page after we've seen everything is fully loaded. Uh, we checked that we had two tables as expected. Uh, in the second table, we looped over all the TR tags, right? Remember that TR is table row. And then within that, we looped over all the TDs, right? So you can see I find all the TRs. Well, first off, I find all the tables and I find all the TRs in that second table. And then within each TR, I find all the TDs, which stands for table data. And then I'm getting that text, right? And I kind of turned that into a one-liner. I could have had a separate loop here, but I have this list comprehension. And, and so then I kind of neatly get this here, which is, is kind of prime material for constructing a data frame, uh, which is what I do in the end, right? And then after that, I can do my real analysis. Okay, so this was all on my laptop, right? You can see it's localhost and maybe it's tricky to install, uh, install Selenium and all these extra things on your laptop. So what I want to do is I want to talk about how we would have done this um, if we were on our virtual machine, okay? And so I'm going to close this here. And um, in, in, in this cell here to the right, or this tab to the right, uh, you can see I'm connected to my virtual machine. And so I'm going to create a new notebook here, and maybe I'll call it October 9. And let me try copying this code that I have over to my virtual machine. So I'm going to copy this stuff. And, and maybe I'll just try to run that as a first step. <clears throat> and so this is crashing. And, um, 
And when I kind of read down, it, it doesn't really tell me much. It's just like Chrome failed to start. Uh, it exited it normally. This weird thing doesn't exist. Really nothing useful. And so I'll just tell you what the problem is. The problem is that when I installed on my virtual machine, uh, it didn't install the regular version of Chrome. It installed what we call um, a headless version of Chrome. And, and the reason is that for my virtual machine, there's no graphical user interface. I kind of don't pop up windows and, and, and try to deal with them. I only access things via SSH, right? So I, I can run the Chrome engine in the background, but I never really have a browser. And so when I'm doing the same thing here with Selenium, what it means is that since I have the headless version of Chrome installed, I have to set the headless option uh, to true. So I'm going to run that, and uh, and now it should actually work. Uh, but notice that I don't have any new window popping up like I did last time. Right? I don't actually have a browser window to work with, uh, which is not great. Right? So how can I actually see, you know, there's a browser window somewhere in my VM, but I can't see it. How can I get the data um, out of it? Well, I could do something like this. I could say uh, b.get and I could uh, try to get this page like before. <coughs> Excuse me. And I could, just like before, I could say, you know, print b.pagesource. Uh, so I could absolutely still kind of use it, but it's hard to see what's going on, right? Since I don't have, um, you know, since it's kind of in this headless mode. And, and so what I'll do to kind of get around this is that uh, I have a mechanism to take a screenshot of a page. And so that's what I can do to kind of actually see what's happening. And uh, and so if I want to do a screenshot, it's like this. I say, I'll come down here, maybe I'll just try to get rid of this for now. I'll say b.save screenshot. Then I can give it a name. So I'll maybe call this like, you know, shot one dot, and it's going to save it as a PNG file. I mean, that's a kind of common type of image. So I'm going to do that. And, uh, and that returns true when it's successful. If I head back over here, right, to all my files, I see that sure enough, it created this shot1.png file. And this is a big image showing me what that page looked like. Okay, so I kind of like to see that in my notebook. And, um, and there's a way to load images directly into the notebook. And that is with um, this uh, module that I'll import. It's uh, just checking my notes here. I'm going to say from ipython.core.display import. And we've actually imported other things from here before, like we've um, imported the display function. Now I'm going to just, uh, import image. And if I do that, then I can create a new image object based on shot1.png like so, and I can do that, and I can basically see um, you know, what I have in, inside of that page, and I can kind of debug that way, even though I'm running on, on my virtual machine. And so ultimately, you know, I won't do it now, but I could copy all of this code over that I had before, and, uh, and it would all work on my virtual machine. And that's kind of the way that I recommend you do it, because it's kind of easier to deal with these screenshots than to deal with installing um, Selenium on your Mac or Windows or, you know, there's kind of a lot of situations where it's very hard to install.